Professor John Hobson. Professor Hobson gained his PhD from London School of Economics, 1991, and joined the department in 2004 as a reader. He previously taught at La Trobe University in Melbourne between 1991 and 97, and the University of Sydney between 97 and 2004. Before becoming a professor of politics and international relations at the University of Sheffield, uh, his, his main research interest concerns the area of inter-civilization relations and everyday political economy in the context of globalization, past and present. His work is principally involved in carrying forward the critique of Eurocentrism in world history, historical sociology, and international relations. Please welcome with me, Professor Hobson. Oh, thank you very much for um, <clears throat> inviting me here today. I think I gave a sort of full taster or a full warning uh, yesterday on an interactive panel was the kind of stuff that I want to talk about today. And, uh, I, you know, I must confess that I was um, <clears throat> really looking forward to giving this talk two days ago. But as the uh, uh, conference proceeded, I found myself uh, rather less enthusiastic as time went on. Um, because I felt that the kind of message that I have here today might be rather sort of um, unpopular um, and, and some may, even, well, provocative would be the nicest way of putting it. But I'm actually very conscious of not offending some people and, and um, I, I mentioned how um, yesterday but uh, I will return to that shortly. Um, now, my talk is called Thinking Interculturally. Um, and so I think the less provocative part of it, something we could all agree with, would be you know, Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, the famous words, the point is not to interpret the world, the point is to change it. But of course, before we can change the world for the better, we need to interpret it, and surely that point would not have been lost on Karl Marx, given that he spent his whole life doing precisely that. Uh, the way we act in the world, I think, is very much informed by the way we imagine the world, the way we think of the world. Of course, you can't just imagine whatever you want, but actually a lot of what goes on is the result or a consequence of ideas, of theories that people have put forward in the past, even if it's a sublim uh, subliminal um, act um, by which those ideas are translated into practice. <clears throat> there are, of course, different ways of thinking about the world and therefore different ways of acting in it, and I don't doubt that there are different ways of thinking interculturally. I have a particular approach to thinking interculturally, though I will not profess complete expertise in this regard, given that I've still not quite worked out exactly what intercultural thinking is. Um, what I want to do, uh, if I may, is talk about some of the ways I think um, what we normally associate intercultural thinking with turns out to be monocultural thinking. And by that I mean that many of the ideas which illuminate and furnish um, the praxis of uh, world politics turn out to hinge on Eurocentrism. And Eurocentrism is something I think remains a, a profound problem in the world today. So long as our theories uh, about the world are based on Eurocentrism in one form or another, what we will end up with is monological thinking. Uh, we will not end up with truly dialogical thinking. And my own um, thinking about interculturalism is really premised on the relationship between East and West, all right, between the Western and non-Western world. And much of the um, discussion in, in the conference is what I would call uh, intra-civilizational relations, in other words, what goes on within Europe. Um, maybe heretical to say, but I see that Europe is a, a multinational entity it's not exactly a multicultural entity. And, and I will confess that there are times when we, we sit around and we pat ourselves on the back and we celebrate the European ideal. And, and I don't wish to denigrate that, and I don't wish to sound like David Cameron, and yet another Brit coming over here saying, what's wrong with the European Union? But there is a certain sense in which Europe, well, there's a very clear sense in which Europe um, developed over a period of a thousand years into an entity that defined itself in contradistinction to others. 
um, either non-white or uh, non-Europeans. And much of the EU literature somehow seems to forget that. It is as if the world was born in 1945, um, or 1957, of course, um, and Europe has a much longer history than that, and not always a particularly proud one, even though our Eurocentric theories would suggest otherwise. Um, <clears throat> Now, when I'm talking about Eurocentrism and international theories and our international thought, you might be thinking, or you might be forgiven for thinking that I've got people like, you know, Robert Kagan and the US Neoconservatives or Samuel Huntington or, or our very own Niall Ferguson. Um, but actually, I've got in mind liberal thinking too. Um, and Eurocentrism is as pervasive on the left side of um, international thought as it is on the right. Um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking particularly of liberal cosmopolitanism, which has come to the fore since 1989, uh, with the end of the Cold War, which celebrates human rights, humanitarianism, and humanitarian intervention. And its theme tune would be, and I can get away with this because Ian Gillan isn't here today, nor is Marcia Barrett, but... Its theme tune, its mantra would not be smoke on the water or we kill the world, it would be d -reams. Things can only get better. My problem is that while liberalism remains mired in Eurocentrism, I'm not convinced that things can only or will get better. So the talk's going to be in three sections. First of all, I will talk very briefly about what I mean by Eurocentrism. Uh, I will then apply it very briefly to liberal international theory. And then I want to give you some ideas, actually from a previous book I wrote, um, about how we might start to think interculturally. Um, and I look, at the, I look at the rise of the West for that, um, for reasons that will become apparent shortly. Now, I think there are actually quite a few different forms of Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism is akin to what Edward Say called Orientalism. And most people have in mind by that term something that's inherently imperialist, and where Eurocentrism and, and racism are in, uh, essentially fused, so there's not much difference between Eurocentrism and racism. Um, that's a, a, a huge point, that one. And, uh, and I'm in um, uh, talks with some of my post-colonial friends about exactly that point. But what I want to say is this, and for the sake of purposes of this talk, I'll say this. Eurocentric institutionalism, what I call Eurocentric institutionalism, locates difference in terms of culture and the rationality of its institutions. Scientific racism tends to focus more on genes, though not exclusively on genes, also focus on temperament, um, uh, climate, um, environment, but genes are part of that story. No Eurocentric institutionalist, from Karl Marx through to... Um, uh, Francis Fukuyama, th even through to Samuel Huntington, has any uh, genetic component uh, in their theory. So, for me, they're not scientific racist. So, when I accuse liberal internationalism of Eurocentrism, please understand that this is no um, subtle way of smearing it as racist. Uh, I, I, I reject that, that point. Now, Eurocentrism was uh, constructed in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, way before 1957, year zero. Um, and there are four key points I just want to specify here by way of summary. Um, first of all, I want, I want to call this um, paternalist Eurocentrism. I actually see two forms of Eurocentrism, anti-paternalist, which is anti-imperialist, and paternalist Eurocentrism, which is imperialist. And given that much of liberal international theory, though not all of it, um, suffers from what I call paternalist Eurocentrism, let me therefore just focus on that. The first point, Eurocentrism. In an effect, constructs a kind of bipolar, what I call a bipolar line of civilizational apartheid between East and West. Right? East and West are radically separated out. They're prized apart. They were always overlapping, but Eurocentrism prized them apart and then reified them into self-constituting entities. Second, there was then created a hierarchy. So West was seen as inherently best over the rest. And the East was the West's inferior opposite other. The West, in the 18th and 19th centuries, as indeed today, was proclaimed as civilised um, in this discourse because its institutions and its culture were said to be rational, 
while the East's institutions were deemed to be irrational. So you've got this bipolarity, but upon that, over, overlaid upon that, is a sort of tripartite, if you like, metageography, if, if, if you will allow me to use that rather pompous academic term. And this talks about three worlds, three worlds of world politics. So the first world is the West. Up till 1945, the West was really Europe, and it was deemed to be civilised, had Russian institutions, had liberal democratic states, liberal capitalism, individualism, science, so on and so forth. The second world was that of oriental despotic states, okay? gargantuan autocracies which squash and suppress their own civil societies and wage war uh, internationally. These are uh, um, clearly uncivilised, especially compared to uh, the West or Europe, but they are more uh, advanced than the savage societies. The savage societies are effectively anarchic black holes um, where, uh, comprising hunter-gatherers, no sedentary economy, um, uh, no science, just voodoo and magic and witchcraft. Um, and then the scientific racists basically bought into this, but they gave the whole thing a nice colour scheme. So you had the White West, um, the yellow Second World, the yellow Barbaric East, East Asia, uh, the Islamic world, and no prizes for guessing the uh, third one, that's the black savage world of Africa, uh, Australasia, and Polynesia. Uh, right, this, this meta-narrative was then developed within the paternalist stream into an imperialist politics. The anti-paternalist didn't do this, Adam Smith and Immanuel Kant, but the paternalists did do this. And basically what they said is that Eastern societies and Eastern peoples are capable of developing, but that they have become blocked by irrational institutions. And it is the white man's burden, it is the duty of the West, of Europe, to go out there and save them from their own um, irrational institutions uh, which oppress them. Uh, and this will be delivered through the Western civilising mission. Uh, Eastern peoples, particularly black peoples, were thought of through a kind of Peter Pan metaphor. Nice, innocent people um, who never grow up of their own accord. So it was the duty of the West to go over there through the civilising mission, deliver the rational institutions so that they too could grow up and mature into a developmental path that would be um, realised um, with their arrival at the end of history, namely um, a European uh, civilisation. Karl Marx was pretty much the same. He just added in another stage. It was called communism, but the same kind of mentality. <clears throat> Fourth, this discourse uh, implies, does not imply a world of sovereign states. What we actually have is a discourse where Western states are in effect awarded what are called hyper-sovereignty, that is the right, the legitimacy to intervene in inferior societies. And the Eastern societies are stripped of sovereignty. They have no sovereignty because they're not civilised, so they can't be allowed the privilege of external non-intervention. And finally, underlying this whole discourse is the notion that the West rose to the top, Europe rose to the top, all by itself, through a kind of logic of imminence. Modernisation and the arrival of modernity was imminent within Europe's social structure. It was imminent because Europe is exceptional, just like today the Americans believe that they are truly exceptional. And so in all stories of the rise of the West, whether you look at Max Weber, Karl Marx, whoever you want to look at, the argument is, in effect, that uh, Europe and the West is a kind of self-made global millionaire who got to the top as a result of his own exceptional institutions. And the East was imagined as a kind of sleeping beauty, awaiting the time when her dashing Western prince would arrive to awaken her from her slumber with a gentle kiss. That gentle kiss is, of course, the civilising mission. I'm not so sure if it was quite as gentle as that in practice, but that was the idea. Eurocentrism in modern liberal international theory. Let me just um, uh, uh, reveal a few points here to make my point, and several points noteworthy. Three minutes. 
Can, if, you, if you want to continue, you will have uh, this is 20 minutes for discussion. Yeah, Leave 10 minutes I mean, I'm not, I'm not bothered about having any questions. Oh, it's not like a problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got a 12 o'clock slot where I'm hoping to get maybe one question. All right, so you're a central liberal international theory. I'm going to have to move quick, aren't I? Well, we find the standard Eurocentric trope of the three worlds here. Uh, the first world is built as a zone of civilization, peace between states, democracy, rational capitalism, and that, of course, is the West. The second world is that of autocratic states, uh, China, North Korea, the Middle East. Well, that in many ways reconvenes the 19th century oriental despotism tr uh, trope. And then there's the third world of failed or collapsed states, which really returns us to the savage black societies of Africa of the 19th century. Many examples of this can be found throughout liberal international theory. John Rawls, well-known political theorist, very well-known, probably one of the most famous, actually, um, views Western states as civilised. He then talks about outlaw states, which really are just second world um, oriental despotisms. And he talks about burdened societies, and these burdened societies really are equivalent to the old savage societies. Robert Cooper, another famous sort of liberal, explicitly talks about the three worlds. Postmodern states found in Europe. These are civilised, they enjoy peace, prosperity, and above all, they have an honest and civilised moral consciousness. The second world, he talks about modern states that basically go to war with each other in Asia, reprising the oriental despotism truth, and finally he talks about pre-modern states, which is just failed and collapsed states, hence back to savage societies. Secondly, we uh, uh, reconvene the hyper-sovereign Western state and now the conditionally sovereign Eastern state. Uh, all Eastern states were granted sovereignty, of course, um, following decolonisation. But now the West has come up with this ingenious thing, this ingenious idea called conditional sovereignty. Should Eastern states fail to act in um, what the West deems to be a civilised way, uh, their sovereignty can be withdrawn. And once that's withdrawn, and once you've given the Western states hyper-sovereignty, then they have the burden, the duty, to intervene and correct the deviancy. Uh, all in the name of humanitarian intervention, of course. Um, <clears throat> how then does liberal cosmopolitanism advocate forms of imperialism? Well, clearly it, it doesn't, for the most part, involve formal imperialism, though a good number of liberals, and in fact increasingly realists, talk about protectorates and actually taking over um, various states um, for decades. Um, but for the most part, it's much more informal than that. So going back to John Rawls, for example... He talks about extending the zone of civilization to incorporate all societies, to bring them all into the Western zone uh, of liberal civilization. Outlaw states, second world of oriental despotisms, those that abuse human rights must be condemned, subject to forcible sanction, and coercive humanitarian intervention in the last instance. And once invaded, it's important that those states become culturally converted to Western civilizational norms and practices. Um, OK, I could give you a few more examples there, but I shall move on. Of course, we come to responsibility to protect, and here I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm, I'm very aware of, of many of the arguments that people have made here. And it's very easy for an academic, as I said yesterday, who basically lives in an ivory tower, to start um, criticising this idea. Um, and I d in no way wish to denigrate the... Um, uh, what many people have done at this conference in terms of making a difference to people's lives. I'd love to think my books make a difference to people's lives, but I don't think they do quite the same thing as actually saving people's lives, and people have done that, and I have deep admiration for them. And I recognise that these arguments, too, are contested. All I want to suggest is that this, this, this duty to intervene, it is a paternalist discourse. Now, some would say that doesn't make it wrong. OK. There are also maternalist discourses here, too. Um, and we heard much about Martha Nussbaum. Martha Nussbaum is a maternalist interventionist. And she actually explicitly says, if you want to call me an imperialist, call me an imperialist. But I believe it's absolutely right that I go in there or women go in there and sort out the problems that oppressed Islamic women suffer in some of their societies. If you want to call that imperialism, that's fine. All I want to suggest, and I don't want to, to, to denigrate that, that these are people's lives... Um, and some of them suffering, and uh, it's very easy for a white man to just stand up here and say, oh, look, it, uh, look old chap, this is all just imperialism. Well, well what are you doing? Um, but it is a paternalist discourse, and that paternalist discourse is, is eg almost exactly the same as something called British imperialism. I may be a Brit, but I'm not actually a British imperialist, 
And British imperialism, like French imperialism and like other imperialisms, um, were called civilizing missions. That's what they were called. Now, of course, some of you would say, well, that's just a nice term, isn't it? It wasn't really a civilizing mission. They went over there, killed, uh, exterminated, exploited. But if you read the books, if you read the liberal books on all of this that were written in the 19th century and the early 20th century, these are the exact arguments they made about civilizing these peoples. They were humanitarian missions, and they sincerely believed that. And I don't doubt for one minute that they believed that. Um, as many people do today. They are, if nothing, they are, they are sincere. Um, am I saying they're completely misguided? Well, I don't really want to say that here, but I just want to make the point that there are problems of paternalism, that the West knows what is best for the rest and will act accordingly, and the rest must just sit around waiting for that lovely day when the Western prince arrives and saves them. Of course, that's the theory. But actually, the practice often doesn't really accord with that lovely theory um, and can create a whole series and raft of problems, um, the details of which I can't, won't go into now. Do I have any more time left? Uh, yeah, I think, I think maybe yes, we can give five minutes uh, okay. to the audience to, to ask some questions. I don't need the questions, okay. <laughs> I don't want the questions. I mean, look, I, I, I'm back, I'm back okay. on. I Bad news is take, I'm back on at 12. Take two minutes and then we'll take five Two minutes. minutes. I'll, yes. I'll summarise my 150,000 okay. word book, The Eastern Origins of Western Civilization, in two minutes for you. How about that? <laughs> OK, um, that book argues. What I'm trying to do, what, what I'm actually find problematic about Eurocentrism is not simply the imperialist side of it all. It's actually the fundamental underlying assumptions. I mean, the West knows what is best for the rest, because the West got to the top all by itself through its exceptionalism and through its genius. And what I argue in that book, ISBN number to come shortly, is that um, without the East, or without the rest, there would be no West. Um, at every single turning point of the rise of the West, from 800 onwards when they discovered this thing called feudalism, through to industrialization, there were uh, huge amounts of um, uh, things that they borrowed from the East, ideas, institutions, technologies, um, without which I don't think they would have managed to uh, modernise. I don't wish to denigrate the European achievement, actually. They did break through, the Europeans did break through to modernity. The only, other, um, the only others were, Japan, were the Japanese, of course. They did do something right, if you see capitalism as a good thing, but, and I'm not, going, I'm not going to challenge that idea here, <clears throat> but are we really to believe that it was all done through European exceptionalism and European genius, um, that they came up with all the ideas? And my argument is simply no, and I, there are just so many things um, that I could talk about, but I think I'm down to about 15 seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, 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 will, I will confess defeat. And, and I will stop there. Thank you. I think you, you were more than provocative. So I think the audience need to address some of the issues. So we'll give a chance. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you for this nice um, presentation. I am Abir from Jordan. Uh, my question to you is, do you think that colon colonization or colonialism, since early ages, since it started, is part of this white man's burden, uh, is part of this civilization mission, or what is exactly the true justifications of the West being in the East? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in practice, a lot of... Uh, the empire was not based on some sort of preordained state strategy. It was actually much more diffuse than that. You know, it would be travellers going abroad and then sort of staying there, or some coming back. It's all sorts of very complicated ways, actually. But there is a mindset which says that, you know, the West has a right to go out there. Um, it prides itself that it has a duty to emancipate and the humanitarian intervention that we're here today, um, I'm not saying it's all a bad thing by any means, but 
it, it, it does go back to the whole idea of the civilising mission, and I think that, that that was very much the way... I mean, I've read through tons of these um, academic books, actually, uh, on international theory in the 18th and 19th centuries, and that was exactly the argument, that we're going out to civilise them. Um, and they sincerely believed in it, just as much as people sincerely believe it today, that the only way we can save these societies and rescue them is to get rid of the tyrannical, uh, genocidal rulers first, and then wheel in the Western institutions and the Western companies and the Western oil companies and all the rest of it, you know, and, and we'll give them civilization. And once we've given them that, well, they're not so backward. The Enlightenment always believed, the non-scientific racist side of the Enlightenment always believed that all peoples were capable of rational thinking. So give them the rational institutions and then they can get that rationality and off you go, off they go. They can autonomously develop from there on in. You can wave them goodbye as you sail off back to Britain. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly what it was all about. So far, so good. <laughs> Hi, Alexander Hunt. Um, actually, I, this, this argument, I've, I've heard similar sure. things before with sure. uh, like transformational diplomacy and normative power Europe, these sorts of things that... Yeah. You know, all of these are just, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, but I think one thing that we here, you know, as practitioners of cultural diplomacy see... Uh, can you introduce I, I, Yeah, Alexander Hunt. I'm a graduate student at Central European University in Budapest. Um, but I think one thing that cultural diplomacy aims to do that is slightly different, although if it doesn't, if it doesn't succeed, then it falls into the same trap, is that it's, it's trying to be more of a two-way street. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Of course. Um, I'm not sure that, it, that always it always succeeds, and if it doesn't, then it just falls into the liberal myth, you know, and it's really just real politique with the, you know, I mean, it, it has this criticism as well, that it can be just a kind of um, yeah, a vehicle for, for uh, real politique and just repackaged. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on, on that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'm not, I have not come here, as I said yesterday, to be the spectre at the feast. I believe passionately in intercultural diplomacy. Uh, th there's no question about that. All I'm saying is that if it's still cloaked in Eurocentric precepts, then it can't be intercultural. It's monocultural. Um, that's why I said soft power I have problems with. I mean, it's infinitely preferable to hard power. But it's a Democrat party line, almost. You can almost read it straight off from that. And that doesn't make it wrong or bad. And America's not this big bad thing. I'm not trying to say that. But soft power is still power. Um, does America have a right to speak in the world? Of course it does. But it doesn't have the right only to speak. The only speaker in the world. And until we have speaking going on from all sides and listen to as autonomous agents rather than people who must be spoken, seen but not heard, then I just don't think we're going to get any real intercultural diplomacy. What we'll just get are more and more subtle versions of civilizing missions, rebranded in the latest sort of nice liberal sounding phrases, such as humanitarian intervention. Um, so I'm not here to criticize what you're doing here. I think it's fantastic what people are doing here in many different ways. I want to contribute to it not pull it down. I just want to go an extra step and say, well, look, let's just, you know, if we are really just propagating a sort of Eurocentric project, um, then we're not fulfilling what I think is a very, very noble idea. Thank you very much. Applause for <laughs> Professor Hudson.